Good morning, everyone. Oh my gosh, it's afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing? Good. You got into the lecture, so you're doing real good, right? Yeah. Um, hello, my name is Sierra Hoisington. I am the Associate Executive Director for the Ding Darling Wildlife Society, and we are so thrilled to have you here for David Sibley's lecture. We're super excited about it. The first lecture was awesome. Um, and just a little bit about us. We are the nonprofit fundraising arm for the J and Ding Darling National Wildlife Refuge. And rather than me telling a lot more about what we do, we have a great little video that April, if you want to play. The J.N. Ding Darling National Wildlife Refuge of today isn't here by chance. In the early 1940s, J. Norwood Darling, for whom the refuge is now named, was instrumental in the effort to block the sale of environmentally valuable land to developers. Ultimately, at his urging, President Harry S. Truman signed an executive order creating this refuge in 1945. In 1982, the Ding Darling Wildlife Society Friends of the Refuge began. Its purpose was to educate visitors about the importance of protecting lands, waters, and wildlife. In 1999, this group of volunteers stepped up to lead the building of the Refuge's Visitor and Education Center. This was the first partnership of its kind, where a Friends group raised money to construct a federal building. And it is still the hub of the Refuge today. Why was this necessary? And what is the society's role today? Well, over the decades, the refuge budget has been cut 60%, and it has half the staff it formerly did. Meanwhile, visitors have increased 66% to nearly 1 million people annually. The refuge cannot meet their growing needs alone. So the Ding Darling Wildlife Society works to fill in the gaps where federal funding falls short. Most importantly, the refuge keeps Ding Darling spirit alive by educating generation after generation about the importance of conservation. So visitors from around the world will take that knowledge back to the communities where they live. Today, with the help of generous donors, the society supports the refuge in these primary areas. Land acquisition and restoration, advocacy, conservation education, wildlife protection, biology and water quality research, and internships. What really draws people to Sanibel and the core objective of people is to come and enjoy the JN Ding Darling National Wildlife Refuge. I think Ding Darling would, would just be ecstatic over the fact that, that there are people that are carrying on his legacy. Uh, I mean, he obviously gave from his pocketbook, gave from his heart, but he would be ever so gratified to know that that legacy that he started continues today. The best legacies are not what you do for yourself today, but what you do for the next generation. I wanted to be at the refuge because there were things that I could do here. Every time I come to volunteer, I see the important work of, of that's being done by the Ding Darling Wildlife Society. I see the smile on children's faces and families who are enjoying nature and wildlife. It is so wonderful, it really is, to know that all of this work will be protected for the next generation because of the work that the society has accomplished. Because if we don't do it, who will? Who will do it? To that end, the Ding Darling Wildlife Society is dedicated to ensuring that Ding's legacy lives on at the JN Ding Darling National Wildlife Refuge. We invite you to join us and our thousands of members in supporting the refuge for generations to come. Great, so yeah, that's just a little bit about what we do here at the Society. Um, as some of you are probably members and supporters, we thank you. Without you, we could not do anything that we do, especially like our lecture series. 
Um, and we are so thrilled to have David Allen Sibley here today. And there are millions of bird watchers, but there's only one David Sibley. He knows every North American bird by its shape, by its tilt, by its habitat, or different plumages. It's only natural. He's the son of a Yale ornithologist and has been birding since his childhood in Connecticut. Sibley was only seven when he began drawing birds, filing his illustrations away along with clips about the natural history of each species. As an adult, Sibley merged that encyclopedic, encyclopedic knowledge with his skills as a self-taught artist to become one of America's best known field guide authors. Author and illustrator of a number of books and guides, his unfailing attention to detail is evident. He painstakingly draws what he sees in the field, first in pencil, then in G-Wash paints, putting together books that document each form of each species. Sibley's newest book, which we are sold out of, but we will be getting more in our nature store, is called What It's Like to Be a Bird, published just as the world went into lockdown. It is quite different from his previous works and is not designed to be a field guide, but it helps bring the magic of birds to birders and non-birders alike. It answers fun and engaging questions like, can birds smell? Is that the same bird in my yard from last year? His new book will excite and inspire by providing a new and deeper understanding of what birds are doing and why. Please join me in welcoming David Allen Sibley. Thank you, and thank you all for coming out. Um, what a big turnout. Um, and thanks to the Ding Darling Wildlife Society and everyone who um, made this possible. It's a pleasure for me to be here on Sanibel. Being from Massachusetts right now, it's uh, <laughs> quite a bit nicer here. Um, <clears throat> and I should say the, the video didn't sort of hinted at one of Ding Darling's um, skills you might, might already know. But he was an illustrator um, as well as a conservationist and um, really a cartoonist, actually. But anyway, I feel a real connection to him as a, an illustrator. He was actually the designer of the very first um, duck stamp. Um, so it, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here um, celebrating Ding Darling and uh, to be here in Sanibel. Um, and as Sierra said, my new book is um, What It's Like to Be a Bird. Well, it's new two years ago, the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and it, um, let's start here. It started out as an idea for a uh, children's book. I wanted to do a bird book for kids, and I wanted it to be more than just a field guide um, to introduce readers to some of the amazing things that birds do and to answer a lot of the common questions about birds, like can birds smell? Um, and as I started researching those questions, I was learning so much. Even after my lifetime of studying birds, there was so much information that was new and exciting and fascinating to me that 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 became the entire book, those, that series of sort of questions and answers, just paragraphs answering um, any question I could come up with that seemed interesting. And every single question that I came up with and started researching led to interesting discoveries and more questions. Um, but starting out with the concept of a kid's book, I wanted the illustrations to be really engaging. So um, there's 80, almost 90, sort of featured species that are illustrated life-size in full-page portraits. And this is the kingbird, western kingbird illustration. But as a book for kids, I was trying to channel my own 10-year-old self. So as imagining what kinds of illustrations would have been riveting for me as a 10-year-old. And this is one of my, one of my favorites, as I, I think I, as a 10-year-old, I would have loved that illustration, Birds in Action. Um, and these portraits also gave me a chance to feature some really underappreciated species like double-crested cormorant, which is a gorgeous bird at close range and uh, really doesn't get its due. Um, and among the questions I tried to answer was, um, is a roadrunner really that much faster than a coyote? Um, <laughs> and this is the graphical answer to that question in a 100-yard dash. 
You've got the ostrich way out in front, the coyote not too far behind, Usain Bolt and the Roadrunner just about <laughs> tied, and us average humans lagging far behind. <laughs> and also along the way, there were so many questions that don't have an answer, surprisingly. Even among really familiar backyard birds, there's so much we don't know, and this is one example, this chimney swift. It's a common bird of towns and cities all across eastern North America. Um, millions of people see them every day. Um, and we don't really know what they do all day in the summer. <laughs> they come out of the chimneys and they disappear into the sky. And logically, the only answer is they're up in the sky, a little too high to be seen easily. Um, and there, apparently there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of insect and arthropod prey up there, a lot of baby spiders apparently up at five or 10,000 feet, um, floating around on their little threads. So the swifts are up there somewhere finding food, but nobody knows exactly where, how high, how far, how long. They come back to their chimney periodically or in the evening. But there's a very basic question. Um, nobody sees chimney swifts much in the middle of the day. <laughs> and we don't actually know what they do. Um, and the other question is where they spend the winter. Um, the few specimens that have been collected are from the eastern or western Amazon basin right up against the Andes in Peru. Um, and they sort of blend in with all the local resident swifts in, in the tropics there. Um, so they could be overlooked, but there's a real possibility that they spend the entire winter in the air. Um, that's been proven for a couple of other species of swifts recently. Uh, the black swift from Western North America and a big, one of the big swifts from Europe um, that winters in Africa. And both of those species with tracking devices on them, they it's confirmed that they don't stop moving all winter long. They're continuously moving. It's possible that chimney swifts do the same thing, and that would explain why there are so few records of them on the wintering grounds. Um, it's also possible that once they leave their roosting chimneys on their, along as they prepare for migration, that they just go up in the sky and start flying. They might fly continuously from, say, Pennsylvania to South America and back. Um, but some really exciting uh, possibilities and unanswered questions about a very familiar everyday bird. And there's so much of that, um, things we just don't understand or know yet. Um, so I'm going to focus on belted kingfisher for a, a bit now. Um, and belted kingfisher, it's a really distinctive common bird here in the winter. Um, and they hover over the water, maybe 20 feet above the water, um, pick out a fish that, th that they want to catch, and then dive headfirst into the water and grab the fish. Um, and while they're hovering, they are flapping quickly and somewhat erratically. Their tail is fanning and closing. The body's bouncing around, waving sort of. The whole body's moving in the breeze. Um, the head stays absolutely still fixed at a point in space in midair while they're making all these adjustments with their wings and tail to keep themselves in that position. And I have a very crude animation that I made of what's going on. Feel free to chuckle at my animation <laughs> skills. But, but this is what you would see if you get a very steady look at a hovering kingfisher or kestrel, um, another species that um, seeks out prey by hovering. And it's just amazing the, that this is possible. They're in, the, in midair. The only reference points are many, many feet away, tens of feet or hundreds of feet away. And they can make the kinds of adjustments that they need to um, account for all of the little gusts of wind um, and other 
variations that are coming along. So this, that's simply that thing, that one thing that they do for a few seconds at a time, multiple times during the day. It involves, first of all, flying, which is an amazing skill. It requires a lot of exertion, the constant flapping and moving and adjusting. Um, so they have to have a really good respiratory system. They have to be able to sense the air currents, to know how they need to adjust. They have to have a really good sense of balance to know which direction their body is moving all the time so they can correct for that. Um, a lot of it relies on vision and then the physical adjustments to account for all of that, the wing movements, uh, tail movements, and most of the, the, they absorb all the motion of the body with their neck. Um, birds have really long necks. We don't think of that because it's all covered with feathers and doesn't look like they have tremendously long necks, but they have very long, flexible necks, even a bird like a kingfisher. Um, and the neck is doing all the work of adjusting. So at the same time that their wings and tail are moving to keep them steady in the air, the neck has to compensate to adjust for every movement of the body to keep their head fixed in space. So we'll talk about some of those things. It all begins with feathers, which begins with dinosaurs, <laughs> because we know now that birds are the direct descendants of dinosaurs, and many, many dinosaurs had feathers. Um, this is Anchiosaurus, um, which was about the size of a roadrunner, a small chicken. Um, so a little tiny dinosaur, 160 million years ago. And uh, it had feathers. And this, the, the reason I chose to illustrate this one is the fossil of this dinosaur was so well preserved that researchers were able to look at it under a microscope and see the pigment granules in the feathers. So they could reconstruct the pigment of this dinosaur and it hypothetically looked something like this, black and white speckling a gray body and a rufous crest. Um, all the dinosaurs were wiped out about 100 million years after this, when an asteroid hit uh, in what is now the Yucatan. Every dinosaur went extinct with that impact, and many, there were many bird species by then. Um, the first true bird appeared about the same time as this dinosaur, 160 million years ago. So 100 million years of bird evolution was reduced to just three species by the asteroid. Three species survived that impact and, and then gave rise to all of the 10,000 plus species we see today. Um, so this is the, the um, evolution of feathers, the sort of timeline of the, the evolution of feathers. Feathers began as a simple hollow bristle on the left. Um, the very first structure that uh, could be called a feather, or the precursor of the feather. And then the next stage, the fibers that make up that bristle separate into um, thin strands to make a sort of fuzz or down. And at those stages, it still would have been useful for insulation. It could have been colored for camouflage or display and also provide some protection from um, uh, elements or other things. Uh, the next stage um, is a branching pattern, a central shaft, and sort of wispy barbs along the sides. And that's similar to an ostrich feather. Now, if you're familiar with that, the barbs on the sides are loose and soft. They don't uh, hold together. It doesn't form a flat plane. Um, so it's not much use for flying um, because it just flops around as you wave it through the air. The next stage another le level of branching develops. So there's a central shaft, the barbs on the sides, and on each barb, little barbules that connect to the neighboring barbs to hold them together. And that forms a pretty sturdy flat surface that then can really move air and doesn't, get, uh, doesn't just flop around. So that's the point where flight really becomes possible. And the last feather there is just a very specialized version so once that, that three-branched structure developed, then it became specialized in 
an endless variety of feathers that we see on birds today. And that one on the far right is one of the long flight feathers from a bird like a crow or a, a sparrow. And the flight feathers are incredibly finely tuned, specialized. They're asymmetrical, the leading edge is narrower, the barbs on the leading edge come out at a different angle, they're a different thickness, uh, the tip is narrower, the shape of the shaft changes along its length to give it different properties of flexibility and strength. Um, it's just an incredibly finely tuned um, flying device. So one thing this timeline tells us is that flight is a fairly recent adaptation or ability in the evolution of feathers. Feathers evolved first for um, insulation and coloration and only gradually specialized to the point where they're useful for flight. Um, another thing about feathers that I learned that was a big surprise to me as I worked on this book is that feathers are waterproof because of their structure. Um, birds preen a lot. They reach back to near their tail and get preen oil on their bill and rub it all over their feathers. And I had always assumed in my lifetime that that was what made feathers waterproof. Um, but it's actually the structure of the feather, the spacing of the barbs works sort of like Gore-Tex. The spaces between the barbs are too small for a drop of water to go through. The surface tension of the water keeps the water from being able to squeeze through those tiny gaps. And the oil probably helps to keep water from sticking to the surface of the feather, but the the arrangement of the barbs also keeps the contact to a minimum. So a droplet of water sits on the feather, but it's making very little contact with the feather. So gravity can pull it right off. Um, so the way water rolls off a duck's back, it's mostly because of the structure of the feather that works to make, make it waterproof. Um, and I have a friend who's researching this now and uh, she says it's uh, much more complicated than I make it sound. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think the basics are essentially true, that there's the structure of the feather is a key part of their waterproofing. Um, and that was really uh, uh, mind-blowing to me that um, that would work. And what's going on with cormorants, you see cormorants, they come out of the water and they stand on a piling or a rock and spread their wings. And clearly they're drying their wings, but scientists still aren't convinced <laughs> of that. There's, um, it's been very difficult to, to prove that that's why they spread their wings. And not all species of cormorants do it. Um, but anyway, they have a slightly different feather structure. Their feather is shown on the right with the, the center of the feather has barbules, so the barbs stick together tightly at the right spacing to prevent water from going through. And cormorant's feathers are waterproof. Cormorants do have preen oil. Um, their feathers are waterproof. Their skin doesn't get wet. But the margins of the feathers, where they don't have barbules, um, water can stick to those. So a film of water forms across the body of a cormorant where it sticks to the margins of the feathers. But it's only on the surface. And, um, and presumably then, they, I think they can only swim for a short time, like 12 minutes or 15 minutes, something like that. And then they get so waterlogged, they have to get out and, and shake water off and dry off. But, um, no one has figured out why they have this uh, arrangement. It's, um, they must get some advantage from it and it might, be, it might make them uh, more um, re reduce friction in the water, trapping a layer of water on the surface of the feathers or something like that. But again, that's another mystery. No one has really looked into that and tested that. Um, but cormorants do have preen oil and they are waterproof, essentially. They just get wet on the outside. Um, the other species similar to this around here, the Anhinga, um, their feathers are not waterproof. They are, as far as I know, the only species that is not waterproof. And when they jump into the water, water just goes through their feathers right to their skin. 
They don't trap any air, so they're not buoyant, and they just sink under the water. Um, and that's a very different, again, they, I think they still have preen oil. Their feathers, they preen their feathers and oil them to keep the feathers in good condition, but the oil, it, the, it's the structure of the feather that allows water to go through. It soaks right to their skin. Um, so they sink underwater, and you just see their head poking out as they're swimming along uh, looking for fish. And, uh, uh, and that obviously limits where they can live, because um, they, uh, they have to have nice warm water to swim in. Um, now, feathers are obviously critical for flight, but there's so many other adaptations of birds that make flight possible and efficient. Um, and one of the big ones is just the arrangement of body parts. Um, so this is a kind of a cross-section of a pheasant in flight. It's the gray showing the outline of the feathers, what we would actually see as this pheasant flew by, and the red parts, the flesh and bones of the body. The tail is completely feathers. The wings are almost completely feathers, just some slender bones and tendons. There's a thin neck, a small head, a small lightweight bill, and everything else is in one compact central body mass that is centered below the wings. So it's a very stable and uh, efficient arrangement of weight for flying. Um, and everything, all the big muscles, the muscles that control the wings are in the breast. So again, below the body, and right in the center, the legs are controlled by the big leg muscles, the thigh, which is really incorporated into that central body mass. It's, I mean, you can see it when you buy a whole chicken at the grocery store. It, it fits in a round package. There's nothing else to it. <laughs> um, and that is one of the things that makes flight um, possible. Um, and the fact that birds have no teeth because teeth would be too heavy and too unbalanced to have big, heavy teeth out there, kind of stretched out in front of the body. They swallow their food whole, and it gets ground up or chewed, essentially, in, inside the stomach, which is, in the, again, in the middle of the body. Um, so this, like if you're out here, you see a heron or an egret catch a big fish, a one-pound fish, it will gulp that down. It might take a minute or two to get it all the way down. And then it's in their stomach. It's in, in their central body mass. They can take off and fly just fine as soon as it's sort of stored inside their, their body. They're still balanced and able to fly. So the whole digestive system also has evolved to make flight um, efficient. Um, now I mentioned breathing for the kingfisher. Um, birds have a... a respiratory system completely different from ours. Uh, it's one of the, their systems that is, has almost no relation to our respiratory system. Um, and it's one of the things that was really surprising to me. I, I didn't really understand it before I started working on this book, and it took me a long time to understand it and to do these diagrams that try to simplify it enough to make it <laughs> easily understandable. Um, so they have a system of air sacs that control the movement of air. And the lungs, shown here in purple, are rigid. They're, they don't expand and contract like our lungs. They're fixed like a car radiator. And air flows through the lungs in one direction all the time, um, from the back of the bird to the front. Um, and because the lungs don't expand and contract like ours do, they can have much more delicate membranes and a more efficient arrangement of blood vessels, so the gas exchange in the lungs is more efficient than ours. Um, and when a bird breathes in, the rib cage expands, which pulls air in through the mouth from the right. So air comes in through the, the bronchial tube and into the rear air sac, which inflates while some air, fresh air, is pulled forward through the lungs, and used air fills up the front air sac on an, an inhale. When the bird exhales, 
fresh air from the rear air sac is squeezed out and pushed forward through the lungs and out through the mouth. At the same time, the used air from the previous inhale, which was stored in the front air sac, is now pushed out through the mouth. So a bird is getting fresh air through the lungs on inhale and exhale, a continuous stream of fresh oxygen with no break, unlike our feeble respiratory system that requires us to exhale and then breathe in a whole fresh set of air before we get more oxygen. So it's an incredibly efficient respiratory system and it's, it's thought that this is a holdover from the dinosaurs, that this respiratory system evolved in dinosaurs hundreds of millions of years ago when there was only about half as much oxygen in the atmosphere as there is now. So they needed a super efficient respiratory system. And birds are now the beneficiaries of it and use it to full advantage by flying. Um, Bar-tailed godwits fly 8,000 miles nonstop from Alaska to New Zealand. And birds migrate over the Himalayas up above 30,000 feet. Um, and experiments with hummingbirds have shown that they can still fly at an oxygen level equivalent to about 45,000 feet. And even a bird like the chimney swift, if they're going up to five or 10,000 feet every day to catch spiders, imagine getting up in the morning and climbing 10,000 feet. It's like Mount Washington twice. Um, so. The respiratory system of birds is, is a, a big part of what makes their, their epic abilities possible. Um, now the kingfisher hovering there has to have a very delicate sense of air movement around it, but it's wearing this insulating coat of feathers. And um, the way they do that is apparently through uh, specialized feathers called phyloplumes. So every single feather on a bird's body has a set of these wispy little phyloplumes growing at its base. And the phyloplumes are connected to um, nerves. And apparently, the function of the phyloplumes is to monitor the movement of feathers. So every single feather on a bird's body has this very delicate sensors um, to detect movement, so the kingfisher presumably can tell which feathers are being lifted up because there's air turbulence around them or pressed down because there's some gust of air pushing against it or moving sideways or if feathers are sticking together and not moving freely. They sense all of that and that has to be how they're uh, able to make these uh, the incredibly fine adjustments that they must be making to keep in position. And this, I think, also comes into play in um, the flight of geese, birds that fly in a V formation like this. Um, it's been shown now that they're tracking the updrafts from the bird in front of them. So this illustration shows two geese, the one on the right with the the way the air is moving in its wake. So the air left behind by that goose on the right is mostly moving down. But at the tip of each wing, there's a swirl of air that circles around and creates an updraft, of air moving up off the wingtip. So the following bird can position one wing in that updraft and get enough of an advantage to really pay off but they have to be able to sense the movement of air to that level to be able to put their wing into that updraft, to be just offset enough to, to catch that updraft. And even more, apparently they're not just following the bird in front and kind of generally putting their wing at the right level, the right line relative to the bird in front. They're tracing the wing beats of the bird in front so that that updraft, as the bird in front is flapping, the updraft is being formed on an undulating path. And the trailing birds apparently put their wings into that same undulating path. So they're actually 
tracking that little updraft as it moves up and down from the bird in front. And that uh, says to me that they have just an amazing sense of air movement, that every part of their body and wings all the way to the tips are sensing air movement and able to react to it. Um, and that kingfisher has to have a sense of how its body is moving all the time to know whether its body is moving up, down, side to side. Oops, sorry. And uh, birds have an incredible sense of balance. You see it with like this black-headed grosbeak, a bird perched on a tiny twig and swinging its head around. You see it with a bird like a white ibis, say, and they'll stand on one leg on a tiny twig in the breeze and then preen. Well, they're swinging their head around, grabbing feathers and pulling at them all the time on one leg on a tiny twig that's moving, and they stay balanced. And um, so we have a balance sensor in our inner ear, and birds do as well. Um, but if we, you might be able to stand on one foot, but if you start swinging your head around, you're going to lose your balance. Um, and birds have an extra balance sensor in their pelvis. Um, so they can track the movement of their body and their head at the same time, separately. And I think that explains a lot of how, how an ibis can stand on one leg on a, a slender twig and the kingfisher can, can keep its head perfectly still and at the same time monitor the movement of its body in the air. Um, and birds have incredible vision. It's a big part of a lot of what they do. Um, this uh, Phoebe is demonstrating one of their abilities, which is that they process visual information much more quickly than we do, more than twice as fast. So, we process images at something under 25 frames per second, 25 images per second. Um, when it gets faster than that, we see it, we see the images blur together. So movies and videos are 27 or 30 frames per second, and we see it as a blurred, or we see the, the images blur together as a moving picture. Um, and that works for us, but presumably, well, this Phoebe will be uh, processing images at 70 per second. Uh, so presumably they would see one of our movies as a slideshow, <laughs> just a series of still images. And when you think about what, that, what the value of that is, it's pretty clear that as a bird like a Phoebe, um, many other species flying through tight spaces like through foliage at 15 or 20 miles per hour, and this bird tracking the movement of a flying mosquito or gnat, following it in flight and then snapping it out of the air um, requires that kind of um, precise vision. We wouldn't be able to do that because it would all be a blur. <laughs> Trying to fly through tangled foliage at that speed would just, the oncoming branches and leaves would all blur together. Um, and the other thing about flycatchers catching insects in midair, they're not just flying through and, and letting, letting their mouth engulf the insect. They're actually plucking it out of the air with the tips of their mandibles. Um, so the next time you see a mosquito or a gnat flying around, just try to grab it out of the air with your fingertips. <laughs> um, Birds also see a much wider uh, field of view than we do. We see just not quite 180 degrees, and we see one point of detail with both eyes, one tiny point of detail. Um, birds like this snipe, their eyes are positioned on the sides of their head, and even the shape of the head is modified so that they can see 360 degrees around them and 180 degrees overhead. So they are seeing at one time the entire hemisphere of horizon and sky around them. And they have, instead of one point of detail, a band of detail that they see along each horizon or each side 
along the horizon around them. So they're taking in an incredible amount of information and seeing a huge area around them, um, which fits perfectly with their, uh, their style of avoiding predators, which is to freeze and let their cryptic coloration protect them. And while they're doing that, they sense a predator and they freeze and crouch, but they can still see everything around them without moving. And if a predator or some danger gets too close, then they can decide whether to take off and fly away. But they don't have to move until that moment when they flush. They can stay perfectly still and let their coloration keep them safe. And we all know the expression eagle-eyed, which is well, well deserved. They see uh, a lot more detail than we do, about five times more. Um, and also, they see a lot more color. So where our, our eyes, our vision is only about 5% of our vision is devoted to color. Um, in eagles, it's about 80%. So they're not just seeing a lot more detail. They're seeing an unimaginable intensity of color. Um, and a lot of birds can see ultraviolet wavelengths as well. So a whole extra range of color, a whole extra band in the rainbow. Um, and eagles, uh, they see two different focal points of detail with each eye, all pointed in different directions. So they're taking in um, a lot of peripheral vision, almost 360 degrees of peripheral vision, and these four points of detail. They don't see very well straight in front of them. Um, so the eagle on the left here is actually giving you its full attention. It is studying you with one eye. That is how a bird will look at you with great interest, is turning its head to the side to stare at you with one eye. Um, and that's what robins are doing when they're hopping around on the lawn. And it looks, it seems like they're listening for worms. They're actually tilting their head to point one eye at the ground to study something visually. Um, and the head bobbing that pigeons and chickens and other birds do is also all about vision. Um, they're actually doing something like what the kingfisher is doing in midair. They're holding their head at a fixed point in space while their body moves forward underneath it as they walk. So with each step, the head snaps forward, stops at a point, and stays right there while the body slides forward underneath it. As soon as that foot hits the ground, the head snaps forward, and the next step, the body moves forward underneath it. And that way, they can monitor their surroundings more, uh, uh, in more detail and see movement better, detect movement better. If, they're, if you stand, hold perfectly still, um, you will notice anything moving around you. Um, and researchers confirmed this by putting pigeons on a treadmill <laughs> and found that when pigeons are walking on a treadmill, um, so that they're walking, but they're not moving relative to their surroundings. They keep their eyes fixed on their surroundings, but their head doesn't bob. They just keep walking with their head in one spot. So what the kingfisher is doing, while it's hovering there and holding its head perfectly still, it's probably using one focal point of one eye to stare at a fish in the water, deciding whether it's worth uh, diving down or not, and one or two focal points in, or one, one focal point in, in one or both eyes to fix on some distant um, reference point to sort of triangulate its position so it, it can tell that it's staying in one spot and not moving. Um, so taking in at least two separate visual inputs at the same time of tracking a fish and using its vision to, to um, fix, to, 
to triangulate its position and know that it's holding still. And so far I've just talked about the physical, sort of physical adaptations, but the kingfisher is also making decisions, obviously, about which fish, when, um, if it's worth it. And it was one of the things that struck me as I worked on this book is how much of a bird's uh, actions are actually decisions, um, weighing different options. They're guided by instinct, of course, but instinct has to be a much more subtle uh, motivator than, uh, it's not a robotic command. It has to be just sort of a subtle motivation that it would be a good idea to do this soon. <laughs> and then the birds can figure out, weigh the options. So this, as an example, is titmouse. Birds like titmice and chickadees, they grab food at the bird feeder and fly away. And you would think it would just grab the biggest seed and take that, but the biggest seed carries some risks. It's harder to handle, it's heavier, it's more conspicuous to a predator or a thief that's watching. It's gonna take more time to process it back in the forest. It's gonna be hard to find a hiding place for it. So a smaller seed might be a better option. Um, and one of the things that birds apparently do is judge the weight of a seed. So you'll see birds come to the bird feeder sometimes and pick up several seeds in quick succession and drop them and finally decide this is the right one. Um, two seeds of the same size, the heavier one is likely to have more fat and be more valuable. So they're actually looking for the heaviest, the best weight to size ratio of a seed they can find. But those, they're decisions all day long. Um, chickadees, um, even though they're constant visitors at bird feeders eating sunflower seeds and other things, um, as adults, when they're feeding young, they feed the young um, mostly insect larvae, little green worms, caterpillars, um, except the first week after the young hatch, the adults apparently seek out spiders and feed a much higher proportion of spiders to the very young baby chickadees. And spiders, apparently, are high in taurine, which is an essential nutrient for brain development. So the adult chickadees somehow instinctively know that they need to feed their young spiders and, and then high protein insects. And then later, once the young have fledged, the adults bring them to the bird feeder and show them, this is where you get sunflower <laughs> seeds. Um, and even gulls, gulls are famous for eating garbage, but when gulls are feeding young, they'll go to the dump to get food for themselves, and then, oops, sorry, too much gesticulating. The gulls will go to the dump to get food for themselves and then fly out into the ocean and get crabs, fish, shrimp to feed to their young. Um, crows understand the concept of fair trading um, researchers worked with crows in captivity and found that crows that were given items of perceived low value would <laughs> refuse to trade with that researcher in the future and wanted to trade with someone who gave them high value things. Um, and crows also, researchers who study crows find it very difficult to trap them because the crows, once one crow has been trapped, all the crows recognize the dangerous person. And it's been shown that crows will recognize a researcher who trapped crows even when they were not the crow that was trapped, even a mile away from the trapping site and five years later. <laughs> crows still recognize the bad guy. Um, and a similar thing was shown with mockingbirds. Um, when you think of we recognize crows as smart birds, but all birds are quite smart. And mockingbirds have also been shown to um, single out people who have actually disturbed a mockingbird nest will be singled out for more aggressive attacks than people who haven't actually walked up to the nest. And finally, the blue jay, I mean, the, 
I think, I hope I've given you some sense of the, just the amazing variety and abilities of birds. Um, blue jays, um, again, in the crow family, they're, they're quite intelligent. They hide thousands of acorns and other items each year, each fall for use during the winter and spring. If a jay is, um, if it sees another jay watching it while it's hiding an acorn in the leaf litter, it will circle around a couple minutes later when it's not being watched, dig up that acorn and hide it somewhere else. Um, so they understand devious intent even. Um, so this just a small sample of what's in the book, which is just a small sample of the amazing world of birds. And um, I hope I've given you some sense of what it's like to be a bird. And uh, I think that the, um, uh, you know, the, one of the things I came away from this project with that I had always sensed but not really known so explicitly is just how resilient and adaptable birds are. I'm confident that birds will survive. Um, and the biggest thing we can do for birds is just give them space to do what they do. Um, they need their own habitat. Um, and here at Sanibel, you have all done an incredible job of that. Um, this is a model for other places to follow, the amount of protected land and bird habitat here. And obviously, it's it's not just good for birds, it's good for people too, which is why everybody, every person wants to come to Sanibel. <laughs> so kudos to Sanibel for having the foresight to um, create this uh, haven for birds and people, and uh, it's time to take this model to the rest of the world. Um, thank you. And we do have time for just a couple questions. Yep, in the back. Uh, yes, birds, all birds can smell, and most of them smell better than we do, have a better sense of smell than we do. And uh, um, yeah, and there's all kinds of examples. They, like a chickadee that's exploring nest cavities, holes in trees, if it smells a predatory mammal like a raccoon, around a hole, it won't go in. Um, birds react to the smell of, so when insects are chewing on a plant, the plant releases um, chemicals that warn other plants nearby, um, and the birds react to that smell um, because it's a sign that insects are there. Um, albatrosses have been shown to track smells over the open ocean for 12 miles. So yes. It's right there. Have there been any more recent findings on magnetic fields and harmonies? Or? Yeah, birds also have a magnetic sense. And um, there's a lot of research on that. And some recent research, I'm not really up on all of it. But a lot of what's what the parts, the stuff that I know about, um, there's at least two different potential magnetic sensors that birds have, and they can sense not just the direction of the magnetic field, but the slope. So the magnetic field comes out of the Earth at one pole and, and kind of arcs over the surface and back in at the other pole. So it has a slope at where it, it's, um, it's parallel to the ground at the equator, and slopes down to the pole, and um, birds can sense that, so it apparently gives them some idea of latitude. Um, and the, some of the magnetic sensors that have been uh, detected in birds are um, close to or related to vision, so there's a, an idea that um, birds might actually see the magnetic field in some way, that it might be uh, connected to their visual processing. And I think um, we think a lot about magnetic sense in terms of migrating birds, these long distance migrants finding their way, but I think that it, it's it got to be incredibly useful for 
all birds, um, and all birds have it. Um, so like if you're canoeing through the mangroves here, these winding trails and tangles, uh, wouldn't it be helpful to have a little compass reading in your eye that told you all the time what direction you were heading? I think, I think birds would probably find it useful all the time just working around their territory. So, but yes, there's lots of research and lots of new stuff coming out on magnetic sensing. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're, they're very communal in their roosting in the fall. Um, this is after breeding um, and during fall migration or just before fall migration. They'll, they'll gather sometimes in huge numbers and all go into one chimney. And the chimney they choose, it's probably just um, the right... Um, the right size, the right height, the right dampness, the right uh, the the walls inside have to be the right texture for them to grip because they just cling to the walls with their claws, and then probably a lot of tradition of just this chimney has been safe. We've all used it before, um, and the the choreography of those kinds of motions is always just fascinating to watch. That they're probably circling around and maybe a little nervous about going into the chimney, not knowing if there's going to be a, you know, a raccoon hiding in there or who knows what. And then a couple go in and everything seems to be okay. So everybody says, okay, pile in. <laughs> but it, yeah, I, I don't know if that's exactly what's going on, but that a lot of bird communal activity like that seems to go that way where they'll just kind of mill around and loiter for a while, and then suddenly everyone at once decides, okay, it's time to go. Last question. So th there are some birds, I'm, I'm forgetting which ones, that, that have this big mass that, that, that just sort of you know, form or morph. And, and you know, what are they doing? Yeah. Uh, questions about the big flocks of birds. You'd see it. Um, there's some online videos of starlings, the murmurations, murmurations of starlings where thousands and thousands of birds get together. But you see the same thing here with big flocks of shorebirds, um, the small sandpipers especially, um, and especially when a predator is nearby, like a merlin or something, that the flock will make these incredible kind of uh, amorphous movements, um, and that's um, something that uh, it was figured out a f oh, maybe 10 years ago. There was a couple of studies on that. Um, so what's happening is that the, well, there's a flock and there's a predator or a potential predator, and the birds on the edge of the flock feel more vulnerable. So they want to be in the middle <laughs> or they want to turn away from the predator. Or maybe there isn't a predator, they just you know, feel like they want to go that way. And so if one bird turns, its neighbors react. And if, if they say, OK, let's turn, then more react. And it's like the wave in a stadium, where it's just <laughs> reacting to neighbors. So you can get birds turning into the flock from both sides at the same time, and then back out. And every bird's trying to get into the middle of the flock to be protected by the numbers. Nobody wants to be a straggler out on the edge. And they all want to stay far away from a predator. But it's really, there's no leader. And it's just um, every single bird reacting to what its neighbors are doing. And many different ideas of which way to go. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you again to all of you. One thing I did forget to mention is that this lecture was very generously sponsored by Drs. John and Wendy McCabe, uh, Stan and Connie Grayson, and Hightower Advisors. So a big thank you to them. Without them, we could not have brought David here. 
And remember, the best thing that we can all do for conservation is share what we learn with other people. Um, if we just keep it within ourselves, it's not going to spread. So thank you for just being really great supporters of conservation. Um, our next uh, lecture series uh, speaker will be at the community house next Friday. Um, it's Jack Davis, and he'll be talking about bald eagles. So we hope to see you there. Thank you.